Welcome everyone to this celebration of Tagara's uh, third Carcanet collection, Virga. It's a, a wonderful book and one of my uh, my favorites of his. It's the third we've published by him. Um, we started about 20 years ago in when we published his poems in New Poetries 3 and before that in PN Review in 2001 when I ran a set of 14 poems which had come into the slush pile and which um, were astonishing to read. Uh, Tagara was born in 1975. He was reared in Zimbabwe. He went on to study in The Hague and in Paris. Uh, back in Harare, he was a journalist. He worked uh, for a film script production company and he wrote. His poems have been published in magazines in Africa, of course, in Europe, in, in Zimbabwe, South Africa, and the United States. His uh, earlier Carcanet books are entitled Spirit Brides from 2006, and then eight years later, Gumi Guru. Uh, Virga is a Poetry Book Society autumn recommendation, uh, and it's he's been shortlisted in the past for the Glenna Luce uh, Prize for African Poetry. I'm also thrilled to um, welcome Sisi Jaji, um, for who will be discussing the book with uh, with Tagara and who will be uh, master masterminding the uh, questions that I hope you will all be placing in the in the in the Q and A box. Um, Sisi's uh, book, Africa in Stereo, Music, Modernism, and Pan-African Solidarity, uh, is a pretty substantial and important contribution to, to her area of study. But she's also written and published three collections of poetry, Mother Tongues, uh, Beating the Graves, and Carnival, a chapbook in seven new generation African poets. She teaches English and African and African-American studies at Duke University in Durham in North Carolina. He's currently work on, uh, work on two new books. The first, Kastava Westerns, figuring American frontier myth in global black imaginaries, uh, looks at how authors and uh, filmmakers and musicians from Africa and the black diaspora engage with the fictionalized American West. The second project is entitled Classic Black, Art Songs of the Black Atlantic. Her uh, loads of accomplishments include, to my mind, the most exciting piano playing. She has a B mass in piano performance from Oberlin Conservatory and making music remains important to her, though she tells me that her three-year-old child often commandeers the, the piano and not let her hear it. Um, the shape of the evening is this. The, the event lasts for about an hour. Um, your, uh, we can't see you, but you can obviously see us in selection and then all together. And um, we would like to have your responses in the chat box, please. We want to know where you are. We want to know what you think of the reading as it goes along. And in the Q&A, we want you to plant your questions, lots of questions. Um, in the reading, I will be showing you the texts of the poems that uh, that Tagar is is, uh, is performing for us. Uh, you're in charge of your screen. If you don't want to see a great lump of text in the middle of your screen, but want to see Tagar's face saying the words, then you click on various buttons. You, you redispose uh, the the screen so you go to your view buttons, and you're you you can make it look like you want it to look. Uh, if you have any technical problems, please put them in the uh, chat box and. Uh, wonderful Becky, who's behind the scenes and making everything work, will answer them as best she can. Um, uh, so tomorrow morning, you will receive an email from us, which tells you all about how you can get your discounted copies of the book. And we hope you'll obviously buy, buy lots of them. So uh, oh, I hand over now to Tsitsi, who will introduce Tagara, and um, he will then read for 20 minutes. You'll have a discussion, you'll have the questions, and um, then proceed to the evening. Over to you, Cici. Thank you so much, Michael, for the opportunity to be here and for the kind introduction. And of course, a, a tremendous thank you to Togara for writing yet another incredible book and one that I'm excited to have the opportunity to uh, talk with you about today. And, um, and I mean that for not just Togara, but all of you out there across the world. Um, so Michael has done me the great favor of telling you some of the um, uh, career highlights of Togara's uh, um, path in the world of poetry. I wanted to add to that that um, one of the special things uh, that he has done 
across his practice as a writer and as a um, community member in um, particularly the world of, of Zimbabwean poets um, is to collaborate in multiple ways. He's a very diffident and humble person, um, which I adore about you, Tokar, <laughs> because one can be very inflated in one's egos in this time of social media. Um, but he uh, also uh, co-wrote with John Eppel, uh, a Zimbabwean poet based in Bulawayo who has done marvelous things with the sonnet form, among other things, a collection called Textures, which really does create the texture of um, a duet, I'll say, <laughs> as a, a pianist, but a lovely interweaving of two poets who both love the rigor of, um, of a truly specific vocabulary, care over um, word choices, placement on a page, et cetera, um, and a, a work that brings together in so many important ways um, voices that in the sort of mythological version of Zimbabwe and its crises would not otherwise be together. Um, he also is the editor of the Poetry International website's Zimbabwe page and has invited many um, of uh, us, I, well, I'd love to say younger, but Togar was uh, born only one year before me, but um, among others, uh, uh, folks who are all younger in our careers than him, he has invited us to contribute to the, the website and also to uh, special issues of Poetry Journal's most recently, Almost Island, which is edited um, by a wonderful team in India. Um, He's also won all sorts of awards um, and been shortlisted for all sorts of awards. Um, and uh, uh, among those are uh, for his first collection, the Jerwood Alderberg Award, which is a tremendous, um, uh, tremendously important award in England, but also, or the UK, sorry, um, but also the Glenn uh Poetry Prize um, from the African Poetry Book Fund based in the US. Um, and already his uh, new collection, Virga, has been named um, as a recommended uh, book uh, for this year from the Poetry Book Society. Um, and I'll just say one other short word, which is that it's such a privilege to introduce Togar, not only because I'm a fan of his work, but because he is um, the Bamku to my uh, troublesome son uh, via his partner, Rumbi Katedza, who along with um, his daughter, Sana, um, are the dedicatees to this collection. Um, and so I've had the chance to talk with Togara when he's been an invited poet at Duke, um, a real highlight of um, the year in which he and Vatsrai Chigama came. Um, and also just on the streets of various parts of our shared world. I first heard about this collection um, on the sidewalks of Cambridge uh, uh, in Massachusetts when Togara was telling me in uh, winter, I think it might have been a very cold February, that he was working on a book about weather. I was like, okay, well, only one person I know could say that in a, a you know, a, an intriguing and a convincing way, and that is Togara. It has now come into the world, um, and I'm so pleased that we'll have the opportunity to hear this wonderful work, which is rigorous, um, which believes in us as readers who are able to come along or rise to the occasion of following his craft and his range across the English language. Um, and I, I really am excited uh, to be here, to listen to the work and to join all of you in receiving it into the world. So with that, let me invite Togara to take the floor and I will um, sit back and enjoy these poems with you all. Thank you, Titi. Thank you for your kind words. I'd also like to thank um, Michael and um, the Karkinet team for helping me bring out this book. Okay. The Wolf Gates. When the first shot rang out over the Northern Rift, the sky was pale and everything lay stiff and sinuous. The sun somewhere beneath the horizon, silent in its ascension. 
First, the boy fell, clutching his throat. The men behind, behind him fanning out, some fending off the air with their palms, others cupping snow at their hips and almost swimming, others crouching and searching the sky, but never finding where the riflemen lay. The skeleton stop nudging his shoulder with tight coughs. One by one, they fell. And before the sun had even caressed the height of the forest, the forest was quiet again. Uh, that was the first section of the longer poem uh, titled uh, Lens, in which a Russian sniper kills, kills a boy in the Second Chechen War. And in the rest of the poem, he's haunted by this and um, other actions he's taken in the past. <clears throat> the next poem I'm going to read is Gough. Um, Gough Island is um, one of the most remote islands in, south, in the South Atlantic Ocean. It's about 1,700 miles west of Cape Town and 2,000 miles to the nearest point of South America. <clears throat> In 1956, um, South Africa set up a weather station on the island to predict weather patterns. So every six years from then on, um, six people are sent out to live on the island to manage the station. <clears throat> Goff, standing on the glen, he reels in the line and stares out beyond Del Rocks, where silver skies map the route to the Cape, where the, where, where the Atlantic washes up over the continent's foot. Staring out over the bay, he breathes the salt air taking winter home, where the west wind's current will spray up from rocky shores and slither into beds of fine boss, then rise white like prayer above the peninsula where iron skies are knitted with the thread wire of migratory birds diving through Morse code and radio channels, carrying forecasts and news back to where he stands, a world away from the world, radio sound and balloon miles above the glen. Um, the next poem is uh, Queen's Gambit. Um, it's about the um, 1921 chess championship between um, Jose Capablanca and Emmanuel Lasca. Uh, the two were supposed to play some years before, but one were unable to uh, for one reason or another. Lasca then wanted to resign his championship to Capablanca, saying that Capablanca was the better player but uh, Capablanca wanted to win uh, the title fairly. So the poem is taken from a, a series of poems about chess and um, all of the poems um, are named after opening moves of chess. So this poem is called uh, Queen's Gambit. One usually makes blunders for good reasons for instance, because of overexertion, divided attention, or some other hidden failing in one's mental makeup. On this occasion, the Cuban sun was to blame. It had intoxicated me. Emmanuel Lasker, 4th of April, 1921, Havana. 42 years had passed since chess matches and card games for small stakes at Cafe Kaiserhof. He'd left Newmark for Berlin, gained prominence in St. Petersburg, Montreal, Paris, London, emigrated to New York, and was now leaving Amsterdam with Martha aboard the Hollandia. The journey, three weeks from the Feldgrau waters of the Dutch port, the North Seas, Empiric hold opening out to the vast Atlantic where shapes of sky and water loosen to join trade routes washed bright with cyanic light. Plow winds swept over the Strait of Florida. 
but the Gulf of Mexico stirred mildly and gave nothing more. The Orlandia finally entering a bay once known for the sound of fortress bells and cannon fire. The Caribbean Sea cresting the esplanade and seawall of the Malacon. The Grand Master had arrived. And though the city of Collins welcomed him, its, cit its citizens still reserved every prayer for the Spanish officer's son. The match was on. Each man to face the other as both challenger and champion. When they met, the air was humid. The Union Club packed. No one said a word. Only the audience's breath caught the ear. Sugar barons in white linen suits perfumed front row seats with clouds of blue expensive corojo smoke. Every eye trained on the clock beside the board on the wall. The clock waiting to give and divide time and turn thought into movements and ideas and images that would run wild over calm mesmerized scenes multiplied like grains of rice. For years, the world had waited on these men to meet. And when the German eventually lifted his hand, the audience drew their breath as they watched him hesitate, intoxicated by the Cuban sun. Um, in 1986, in northwestern Cameroon, uh, Lake Nios erupted and it released 300,000 tons of carbon dioxide. The gas killed over 1,700 people from several villages. The few who survived described a strange white cloud descending upon, upon them before they fell. For a long time, these villages remained empty. So the next poem is from a series of poems about this event. And it's about one of the survivors returning back to their village. <clears throat> first things first, I'm neither shadow or words. Only flesh could fill these bundles, these bundled folds of grief, these torn faded clothes you once loved that make me question what I must look like. Your daughter says, I slip into the night and sing your name when I'm asleep. That's bullshit. She doesn't know me and has never met you. And all I know is grief from these hills, these hills painted red with absences I could never have expected. Now every thought fails the old practices of this deserted place. This house and these rituals of loss, sweet in the ache of time, falling sweet off the rote of each breath. The years have aged me, hoary, brittle boned. Walking up from the valley Dawn rose and dew and dew bells dripped off blades of grass. The grass sharp at my skin, cutting our shins, my scarred shins bleeding less than my daughter's. And I return because I'm, I'm lost, return for the shadowed sunrise, the shadowed dusk. And walking, I am afraid and remember your fingers slipping neatly into mine, the red broken road burning with the sun behind us burning with youthful promise. Who we were then was the mystery to unfold and draw us back into a dream only I would wake from. Silence ringing heavy and loud, heavy and loud. Soft pulses of sunlight drip through rotting thatch. Ant mounds, pregnant with life, stand pressed into the walls. And I am here and alone and exhausted by chance. Alone with a daughter who dreams of you, 
but we'll never know who you are. We stand by the door and I set my knee to the ground, my eyes lost in the empty hearth. Um, the next poem is the Texan, and I think the um, epigraph explains, um, explains the poem. But um, I have to, the one thing I have to point out is that um, the title of the poem, the Texan, is, um, is a plane, and it's the plane which uh, James Matten flew. The Texan. James A. Matten, noted flyer, was granted permission by the Commerce Department today to make an aerial search for the Russian aviators believed lost in the Arctic wilderness. In making the search, Mr. Matten will be returning a favor from Sigismund Levinevsky, leader of the Russian flight. The Russian went to Mr. Matten's rescue a few years ago when the American aviator was marooned in Northern Siberia. This was taken from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, 15 August, 1937. From Weeks, fields, from Weeks Field, the sun hangs uncertain. The air sharpened by the curse of raised winds Sheets of sky and sea layered silver with ice. Each hour vanishes into broken distances. The shape of the world formed on each breath. Oil drops shivering wet of rivets, the engine moaning dark at the wrists. Evening swivels west as the Texan turns. Her wings banked shallow above the ocean's crust. Pedals and levers at their place for altitude. Through angled glass, the quiet world of a frozen solitude. A vast naked bridge of bruised light, bridging continents, white skirts of blind speed, beaming over lengths of desolate prose. The radio crackles white with endless noise. The ceiling of the world dry with fate and banking into the failing light, he remembers the furled wisps sparked by whips of air turning as the Russian landed, then the rattled chop of blades as the plane left for Nome, the compass marked for home, and all the vaporous qualities of life. Time sinks fast, darkening with ancient layers creaking below, Unsaid prayers the dead have set to verse. A gray breath of air slips heavily off each wing. The flat drone of the engine working the mind to paint the final flight with a grief of art, with a grieved art. The soul's white feathers burning bright as the prototype rolled and crashed deep into the heart of the unknown. Um, something strange happened in Zimbabwe in, 19, in 1994. 62 children claimed to have seen a, uh, a UFO, a craft descend from the sky. And um, several creatures emerged from this craft. Um, there's a note uh, to the epigraph of the poem I'm about to read, um, the visitors, um, Johnny Mack, was um, the head of psychiatry at uh, Harvard Medical School. And he traveled to Zimbabwe to interview uh, the children who witnessed this event. The visitors. Something scared you. What scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the air? 
What was the noise like? Was it a roar, a buzz, or a hum? What kind of noise? It was like someone was blowing the flute. That was Rua, Mashonaland East, 1994. She's late and knows she's late and doesn't put her foot down, but simply cruises as the red disc of the sun hovers in the pale evening sky. Harare's squat silhouette fading beneath a veil of dust that clings to the rear windshield like skin. A township floats by, then farmland, then the turnoff where the car's gearbox screams through each hard shift of the manual change down, her grip welded to the steering wheel. It's all too strange for her. She wonders what Tawu would make, would have made of the visitors. Two years Taurai's been gone. The car stalls in the schoolyard. The Fiat's dark metallic shell hissing in the grainy light. Every day she has left the office late, fearing the drive home. Ever since the visitors came, she has had to endure her daughter's hard-edged silences, the cruel spark in the 12-year-old's eye, the same glare she gave suffering through her father's absence. <clears throat> uh, the bark. Um, the British one cent uh, magenta stamp was recently sold for 6.2 million pounds. It's the most expensive stamp in the world and has a rich history of ownership. At one point, it was owned by a wealthy industrialist, um, Arthur Hind. Upon the stamp is the image of a boat and the boat is a bark. I'm torn between the desire to tell you one of the most thrilling experiences of my life and keeping my agreement with Mr. Arthur Hind. I've been thinking about it ever since I saw in the magazine that his famous Guiana stamp was up for auction again. I'm an old man, Mr. Dietz, and I lead a quite retired life with only an occasional automobile trip, partly across the country. My days of excitement are long over, yet, excite, yet the excitement that telling my story is giving me makes me think I have no reason to feel guilty about the, my agreement since Mr. Hind has passed away and no one will ever know who I am. Perhaps I'm indulging a weakness. I'm indulging in a weakness, the weakness of human nature in wanting someone to know that I had one too. Yes, Mr. Dietz, I had one too. From Alagany to Oneida, a gray curtain of rain blurred the county roads the high boy rumbling east into Utica, where I set up at the hotel and telephoned Hyde. All day, no answer. The next, the next day, the same. But when evening came, I heard the cold click of the receiver and the grunt of his name, the sound of listening. When he spoke again, he gave directions to a house on the corner of York and Main, where a double leaf door opened as the sky burst open and doused the street behind my back. I stepped into the vestibule, hung up my coat, followed him up a flight of stairs into a wainscoted room, panels fitted tongue and groove. 
from hip height to the ceiling, the glint of, of book spines, perfumes of oak and shellac and burnt honey and tobacco smoke. I opened my satchel, pulled the album out of its oilskin pouch, parted the leaves beneath the desk lamp and watched him adjust the, the lampshade as he bowed to study the bark, the square rigged silhouette sailing stark against a pale magenta sky, the clerk's initials, the clerk's initials, the clerk's initialed signature scribbled dirtily into the darkened sails. Hind stepped back, slowly drew his eye up from the imperf imperforated print and studied me studying him. It was then that I became aware that only one could exist. So when the sum for the right of ownership floated off his lips, I nodded. He picked up the stamp, struck a match, and a phosphorus kiss sent the ship on its way. Out along waves mirrored on horizons, wild like reveled seascapes. Flames weaving darkness into the ship's squared sails. And before anything could be said, all was ashes. The bark reduced to a secret, settling quiet at our feet. The last faint notes of flames lost in gentle breaths of smoke, shivering out into slow, calm waves. When I left Utica, the early morning light crept up over the hotel and fell bare on cold, tra on cold tram rails. The streets empty, shop windows blank. I drove and I drove, drove southwest, darts of cold drizzle striking the windshield. The high boy buckling through the black mucklands of Canis Canis Canistota, out to Syracuse via Madison, Genesee, Pennsylvania, and further south through towns where mill wheels, where mill wheels slowed over cooling kilns, giving little or nothing back. And the final poem is called um, Alice. Um, the 28 year old woman referred to is uh, Audrey Maester. Among circles, um, there is belief that there was foul play involved in how she died. May my enemy be assuaged by these waves because they are beautiful even to his evil. May the drizzle be a benediction to his heart, Derek Walcott. Free diving, plunging to the greatest possible depths on a single breath without scuba gear is one of the more extreme contemporary diversions and last week it cost the 28 year old French woman her life as a world record attempt off the coast of the Dominican Republic went tragically awry. New York Times, 12 October, 2002. From the depths, there is no sound of rain meeting the ocean surface, only the grand motion of the deep hoists his wife in great columns of sea. An arm in the half light will only take her body halfway. A diving sled abandoned on the steel line where water flows slower than the wind's history. When the clock counts down, the seconds exceed her time, forcing him to dive and fill his palms with propulsion, corkscrewing and clawing for the ocean's bed. 
the weight of water darkening his heart, compressing, darkening his blood, compressing cavities and plates of the skull. And where pressure condenses air, he snatches his wife from another man's arms and cradling her body, kicks and kicks and races for the sky. Thank you. Well, on behalf of all the Zimbabweans here, woo! this is just uh, beautiful. And uh, I, I have so many questions, um, but I will start with one, um, one which I know you have a lot to share about. Can you tell us um, about the origin of this collection? Um, well, the book started around about um, 10 years ago when um, I'd seen um, a collection of uh, photographs and um, the photographs was, uh, uh, I mean, the book was um, photographs of um, the past 100 years. So it was photographs of uh, uh, the 20th century. And um, these photographs really fascinated me, but they took us uh, through all of the major events of the, the 20th century. So um, at that point, I was also getting ready to start work on um, my other book, uh, Gumiguru. But I was so fascinated with this other book of photographs that um, I kept on writing poems which were set in the 19th century. Um, poems about things which, which had interested me, but um, which were not really of like mainstream, um, mainstream news. So um, these poems began to build and build and build. And um, that's how the book started. Um, thank you. There, there is some curiosity here about um, this, uh, this uh, engagement with historical events. Um, and it makes sense that uh, if photography um, would be one of the ways in which your work was sort of generated or, or prompted, um, precisely because there is this specificity to your vision in these and to um, the, the, the incredible range across spaces and, and um, historical times as well is not um, sort of seeking to be encyclopedic, which I think would overwhelm both the reader and the, um, the delicacy of trying to feel into and look into these events. Um, but this may be a very difficult to, question to answer. Nancy Miller would like to, to pose this, um, but it's also part of my question, which is how do you work through the process of moving from an event and making that event into poetry or how she puts it, how you convert facts into song? Um, it could be simply a question about talk about process, but that's how it comes across to us as the effect of that process. I like that, uh, turning fact into song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, the kernel of the idea would be there. And um, if the subject interested me, then I would um, either read up more about it or go the other way, write what I know about it, and then uh, fact check and see um, what else was going on or if my facts were correct. Mm -hmm. So in most of them, the, um, the poem started first, and then I went and uh, did more reading about the poem. Mm -hmm. That or makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Did I interrupt you or you said what you'd like to say? <laughs> Great. Great. Um, well, I think maybe in relation to that, there's an uh, a obvious and, and enjoyable 
continuity with some of your earlier works in that kind of specificity in an encounter or history, and also in this absolute confidence of, of ranging over the world. It strikes me that it's not a surprise that Walcott provides the um, epigraph of this last poem that you read, because there is this sense where Walcott writing from St. Lucia ranges across everywhere from Poland to North Dakota to wherever it is that, or, or to Greece, obviously with Omeros, wherever the poems take his mind and wherever the history goes is where he goes. And I think that sense that from a small place, one has this entitlement to the entire world um, and access to it precisely because one is not necessarily expected to show up there. Um, and it strikes me that you're starting in Zimbabwe and on a farm. Um, Togara, among other things, is a, a, a masterful cattle farmer. Um, but, you know, like to start from that space of, of the idea from the outside world that this is a small space, right? And, or a small place. And to row from there is really striking. Um, Photography in some ways is close to what you talk about as one of the origins of your entry into poetry, which is going through museums and talking about philosophy with a good friend in, in The Hague and that sort of releasing you from your path as a businessman. Um, we're so <laughs> glad. <laughs> but in any case, um, can you talk about you know what do you look at? What do you read? Um, uh, what is it about? The, the the thing that seizes you in a poem if if there's any generality to that um, um perhaps and then if there are things that you were trying new in these poems that are different from those characteristics of specificity and, and the generation of a, a poem from a history or a geography what's happening there that's too many questions we talked <laughs> about the capacity to do this <laughs> No, the the one the, the one new element which um, really came out um, in the book was um, the the forms of the the poems. Um, I don't know how that came about, but uh, because the book was about weather and um, and the elements, um, there were very few like really fixed poems. You've got some poems which are shaped in certain ways. Um, I also wanted to give um, a bit of air to the page as well. So within some of the poems, you'll they'll be constructed in ways where there's a lot of space around them. And it sort of gives, I wanted it to give some sort of an atmosphere of Maybe the sky, maybe clouds or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some of them are also jagged and um, the one about Zimbabwe was uh, was a sonnet. So there's different, there's different yeah, types. Um, that, I, I appreciate uh, knowing about that because there's the sense in which some of your poems and, and even you know the way that you've talked about them in previous work has been to delve into historical forms that are set forms. And that was marvelous. But here we're seeing how those um, forms, like a sonnet, can take on its whole own um, being and has a different place in relation to this more airy kind of um, collection as a whole. Um, and one of the questions has been, if you could say a little bit more about the eco element of weather, which is so central. And I was interested that you didn't read the title poem, Virga. Um, I was tempted to say, I want to read it and <laughs> force it into this conversation. But really, I mean, can you talk about why the weather, why um, the eco system and this eco element um, and uh, um, if you might share the epigraph of the um, the book and and the, the title itself, that would be wonderful to hear more about. Well, um, the epigraph, um, if I can get it, it's from um, Lyle Watson, and he says, "Where the 
we are the fruits of the wind and have been seeded, irrigated, and cultivated by its craft. Um, the wind is always around us. It's, it's always there. It makes things shift. It's what brings us rain. It's, it's constantly there. The earth, the air has seen everything upon the earth, which has been living. So I thought that was quite important. Um, the 20th century, I think, has seen the most um, dramatic change um, in weather uh, from the 1900s until now. So I also thought that um, the ecological aspect of it and bringing the uh, weather in as a character within the actual book itself, because sometimes um, I would try and use um, the weather to bring in a certain mood or to, to conjure up things. I felt that uh, the weather could help me drive some of the stories forward within the collection. Mm, thank you. It strikes me that the difference between talking about climate and weather is probably the difference between nonfiction and poetry in some senses. So the weather is immediate as well as ubiquitous and, and wind and breath are at the heart of utterance as a whole, but uh, so many of the concerns of poetry in terms of what is a line in relation to breath, um, you know, and it also strikes me that this, the, what you're talking about in terms of wind touching every part of the world, every place in the world, again, seems really important on the one hand in making this global, making this world literature. Um, Edouard Glissant has this amazing French term, um, tout monde, um, which is often translated as all world. Um, so there's a way in which wind shows us, teaches us what all world is, that interrelatedness. But it's also something we know quite specifically from Zimbabwe as, you know, if it means houses of stone, we live among these incredible structures of balancing rocks that have all been eroded by the wind, right? So it, it's a way that I might move towards a question that comes back to something you said that sometimes you write what you know and then go back and do the research sometimes you're intrigued by an event and you delve into it. And that's where the poem comes from. Um, Philip Holmes and Joshua Short had a, uh, similar questions to each other's, which is when writing about things you've not experienced yourself, um, how do you use your own experiences and knowledge and, and what personal connection do you feel to each of these poems when the subject you seem so distant? from you? That's an interesting one. Um, because they didn't feel that distant uh, to me. For instance, um, when um, I was writing about the uh, Bavarian mountaineer, um, I've never been to the Eiger, but uh, just to read about how he suffered uh, as a person. That's where I took the story from. And it wasn't about the mountain itself. It wasn't about going there to the mountain. It was about feeling mm. what this person felt when he was um, stranded on the mountain, waiting for people to, to come and uh, save him. And he had done everything he could to try and save himself. So I don't think um, I felt very far away from the poems. Mm, mm. That makes a, a, a lot of sense. Um, I will just pause to say that if people do want uh, to pose additional questions, um, don't be shy. I know there are a number of our poet friends out there uh, <laughs> listening and reading. So. Uh, put your questions 
there because I've got plenty of my own and I'm just going to launch in on on one of them while um, we give space there. So um, sound, your your poems are, are beautiful on the page, intentional on the page, but poets get to do something that sometimes, well, it breaks the familiarity of language. So for example, Kirsty Gunn was so struck by the newness of the ocean's crust. The last thing we expect, you know, for a, a, an ocean or one of my favorites, a phosphorus kiss, you know, but those, those shock us into recognizing the possibilities of imaginative language, not just by their unexpected, uh, you know, um, the unexpected imagery itself, but also because the ocean's crust, we come back to that, right? And then one of the things that really struck me in Bark, um, I can't remember even as an English professor whether leaves is always with a V or not, but listening to what you chose, which was leaves, that um, this, uh, this person encountering that stamp watched someone uh, turning over leaves rather than leaves, drew my mind back to the fact that a leaf is something very delicate and individual. And um, one would say a, a, a stamp on a philatory or whatever the word is for people who collect stamps in that you know, field of knowledge, but those people would you know, leaf through something, right? So that we're, they're, they're, the point of this whole thing that I'm saying here is your poems work with sound. When you're composing a poem, do you read it out loud as you're revising it? Do you hear something in your own inner ear? Um, anything you'd like to say about sound itself, which after all is, you know, our windpipe um, channeling breath. But. No, certainly um, when I'm writing, um, sound is very important. The audible sound is very important. I will hear the sound in my head, but um, as I'm also writing, I will say it out aloud so that I can hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, that normally happens with the line, but it normally happens after I've done the draft that's when I start really working on the sound itself mm -hmm. to get the fluidity to, to go through. So the lines will first come, then I work over them to, to, uh, to get the sound. Mm, wonderful. Um, our comrade in arms, TJ Dema, uh, has a question for you. Um, can you talk a bit about your citational practice? Um, what she means is uh, the, the use of epigraphs. What do the epigraphs offer the poem or reader that otherwise isn't there? And what, what do you look for in an epigraph? I think the epigraph gives a little bit more information. If the epigraph uh, wasn't there for, for instance, like um, if we take uh, the poem about the stamp, um, if that wasn't there, then the poem itself wouldn't have its it wouldn't have the backstory which we need, because the whole poem is about this man who has a stamp which is equally as valuable as the other man's stamp. But then the industrialist wants to get rid of that stamp so that his stamp is more important mm -hmm. and more expensive. Yeah. So I think the, um, the epigraph is there um, just to add that little bit more uh, information. Yeah. Help I, the reader. Yeah, absolutely. That makes, you know, um, makes sense uh, because basically in some ways what you give us then is a poetry reading each time we come to the work, because in the poetry reading, one can tell us the story of the poem, um, which one 
doesn't have on the page unless you do give us an epigraph. Um, I will say that I think you also give us a lot more in that some of these epigraphs are poem segments from people like Vallejo in that title poem, Virga or uh, Walcott. Um, there's another question, uh, which is our last question from Hannah Lowe. The poems are full of striking imagery. How do you find your images? Do they come to you in first drafts, um, for example, or do you work to find such surprising and precise images? Oh. <laughs> um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think um, some of them, uh, come naturally, and they might come in the first draft. I'd say a good number of them are sometimes mistakes. <laughs> and and um, others, I think, uh, whilst you're doing the rewriting, um, you see that something isn't really quite working, and then uh, you have to find a way to work around it. And sometimes that's where you can um, find some uh, ways of saying things and getting the imagery and stuff like that. Mm. Thank you. Um, what a wonderful answer. Um, and it falls to me to do the cruel thing of telling everyone that we're done now. <laughs> we don't get to hear more from you and of the word um, spoken. So thank you so much for uh, this reading and for sharing so much with us. And I do want to remind people that the gift of being here um, in addition to the now is the tomorrow, which is spend your um, money on Tulgaro's book and spend less than you <laughs> really have to with our um, the code from Carcanet of the, the discount. Um, oh. It is available on, uh, at a discount um, until the 31st of October and the link is there in the chat. Um, so thank you, Togara. Well, I would also like to say thank you to, to you, Tsitsi, and um, also once again to everybody who attended this uh, reading and also to um, uh, Karkinet Press. Mm, absolutely. And I thank you too from Karkinet Press and just say how wonderful the event has been. And it's a joy to meet you, Tsitsi, and, uh, and to have your voice in my head. Um, our next launch will be on the 27th of October, so you have a, week, a week's respite, and it will be um, uh, Gabriel Joseph Avicii talking about his new book with Marina Warner. Uh, but until then, please do, as CC suggests, go tomorrow and buy tons of, tons of Togara's books at discount, and um, come and see us again soon. And congratulations to Togara, and thank you again, CC, for a lovely, lovely evening. Um, we'll leave the chat open for a bit longer so that you can put your final thoughts in for Togara and Cece, who will be seeing the chat uh, entries. So um, thank you very much. And we will now leave you in peace. <laughs>